d bar s. And suppose f of s is compactly supported between minus 1 and 1. If this is an L, L1 function on the interval from min, uh, minus 1 to 1, this behaves like 1 over z, which does not belong to L1. So it's obvious. It does belong to weak L1, but let me not go there. OK. Now, the next thing is, as I mentioned and as we draw on the board, we're not just interested in Riemann-Hilbert problems where the contour is the line. We're interested in Riemann-Hilbert problems on contours which have points of self-intersection. There can be many of them. They can be disconnected and so on. So we would certainly want something like the following. Suppose this is the contour, the part of the contour here, which is sigma 1, and this is the part of the contour, which is sigma 2. What we'd like to have So the integration is taking part, uh, place over si sigma. We would like, for example, let's suppose that this vector f here, or this function f here, is just supported on sigma 1. And let's take z now to belong to sigma 2. So I've got this picture here, like this. z is sitting here and f is supported here. If this operator there is going to be bounded in Lp on this con contour, we would certainly need to know that if I look at f of z on L2, on sigma 2, this should be bounded, or this is cf on sigma 2, should be bounded by f on sigma 1. That would be a consequence of my hope that the operator C is, in fact, bounded on the whole, the whole contour. Now, there's a very nice cal calculation which one can make, again, using Fourier theory, but now using Fourier theory of the multiplicative group on the positive numbers, which is the same thing as the Mellon transform. And so it's a very nice exercise to show the following. just to give you a flavor of it. Take the line 0 infinity and take a line here going off at an angle theta. And we have C theta f at r is integral 0 to infinity f of s d by s upon s minus r z hat z hat is e to the i theta. So I'm just computing this object where sigma 1 is the real line, the, po the positive real line, and sigma 2 is the real half line going off at an angle theta. Then you treat this as a group, a multiplicative group, with the Fourier transform, which is given by the Mellon transform. That will diagonalize this operator here just as the ordinary Fourier transform diagonalized the Cauchy operator on the line. That will turn your operator here into a multiplication operator. And what you find is that C theta f in L2 is less than or dr. There's some constant in theta f in L2 of s. And again, you can turn, to, to turn this into, instead of 2, you can put an LP here by other kinds of arguments. But I just wanted to give you this as more or less as an exercise and use Mellon transform. This gives you a little bit of the flavor. Now, why are 
how are the many ways that this is useful? So let me give you an application of this, which begins to take us towards the question of in what sense do we achieve boundary values? And when will those boundary values, when will the function not just have boundary values, but when will it be continuous up to the boundary? So observe the following. Suppose f belongs to h1 of the real line. So that is f and l2, f prime and l2. Well, this is the distributional derivative of f. And suppose I take the derivative of d by dz of cr of f of z. So it's d by dz integral over r f of s upon s minus z d by s. So I can put the derivative on the z. I can transfer it over to the s. I can integrate by parts, and this comes out to be f prime of s, d by s upon s minus z. So this is just cr of f prime. Now why is this useful? Consider the following. Let me take and what we know then, suppose I've got two points, z prime and z double prime, in the upper half plane. Then I can draw a line through them, going through some point which I'm going to call the point zero. So now I've got an angle theta here and an angle pi minus theta over here. And suppose I want to look at CF at Z prime minus CF at Z double prime. So that will be the integral from zero to infinity of F of uh, S ds of uh, uh, S minus Z. Or let me first of all take it like this. Okay, so let me do this calculation better. So this will be the integral over this line from z double prime to z prime of d by dz of cf of z dz, just by integrating along. But this object here, if I now take absolute values, will be bounded by z prime to z double prime to the half times the integral along this entire line from zero to infinity, say, of d by dz of cf squared dz to the power of half by the Schwartz inequality. But this object here is going to be bounded double prime of one half f prime on L2 of r because of this fact here. If I look at the derivative of this object here, it's the Fourier transform of an L2 function. So what that means is that this object over here, on this line, given by there, is going to be bounded by the L2 norm of this function here. So, 
I've got my function defined here and everywhere in here. It has an H1, it's an H1, it has a derivative. So that means that if I take CF of that function, it will give me a function over here which has a derivative in L2. So I get that bound. And so what's the conclusion from here? Is that a priori, a priori, the function CF in the upper half line is uniformly and globally holder a half. In particular, it has boundary values in the con uh, con continuous bound uh, boundary values. Okay, so that's a little bit about how boundary values arise. Okay. Now, so I have gone through, uh, through this to just give you some sense of what you can pick up from a first course in com complex analysis or theory of bound bounded analytic functions. So now we begin to get to the real stuff, right? So a composed curve is a finite union of arcs in the closed, in the Riemann sphere, which, in, which can intersect only at their endpoints. So things like this. And an arc, let's call arc gamma, is phi of t, where t runs from, say, a to b, and is a homeomorphism on its, uh, from uh, the interval onto the arc. Now, we allow for arcs to go through in infinity, and you use the usual topology on the sphere to control that. And it is curves a, a Composed curve are going to be the contours on which you do Riemann-Hilbert theory. Okay, so we always are going to be look at com composed curve because they are given in this particular fashion. They are automatically oriented. They come with an automatic orientation, which is prescribed by the parameterization. Now. Again, okay, so let me get to this in a moment. Two, all right. In this picture, we think of a circle, say, as being a composed curve, because we always think of it as a union of two arcs. That's convenient. So the first qu qu question, having said what we have, so this, these are going to be the curves we do Riemann-Hilbert theory on. So what do we mean by LP? It's the first question. So what we do is we introduce arc length. Suppose I've got some simple contour, a simple arc sigma, and I've got a succession of points z0, z1, all the way up to zn. These points have an ordering which is induced by the parameterization. And we look at the quantity. L of Z0, Zn for any choice, any part partition of the curve as being the supremum over all partitions of the sum of Zi plus 1 minus Zi 
from 1 up to n. And if this quantity is finite, <coughs> we say that the curve is rectifiable. And we're going to be interested in composed curves, which are locally rectifiable. Which means that if I take my contour sigma and I intersect it with any ball, say z is less than r, then the intersection of sigma with r must be rectifiable. So that means you could have, here's my ball, and I look at the curve going around like this with different pieces like this. When I intersect with the ball, I'm going to get a countable number of arcs, and I want each of those arcs to be rectifiable and their sum to be fin uh, finite in any ball. So the first sort of definition is we're going to look at Riemann-Hilbert problems on contours, which are composed curves, and which are, recti uh, which are locally rectifiable. Now, for a rectifiable or locally rectifiable curve, we can introduce arc length. So, for example, mu i of this interval is just to be the length from uh, alpha to beta. Curve goes from alpha. Now, things are very similar to just the construction of the Lebesgue measure. And such sets, semi-open intervals, form a semi-algebra. And hence, by the usual extension theory, you obtain a complete measure on a sigma algebra, which contains the Borel subsets of that uh, con a contour. In that way, you get a measure theory, and you get a measure which enables you to integrate on each one of these curves. So then you've got an L LP theory. So you get this immediately implies we have semi-algebra, which implies a measure on a sigma algebra. Sigma algebra, etc. So all of this is a stand standard construction. And then you get LP theory, which would be measurable functions with respect to that uh, measure, or with respect to that sig sigma algebra. And you take the LP integral if that's finite, and so on. It's absolutely analogous to what's going on. Just a remark, this is a little exercise, d mu is equivalent to Hausdorff one measure. If you were thinking about it, so you can also put measure on the curves by regarding by and defining a Hausdorff one measure, it's exactly the same quantity that you get. Okay. Now we come to, and once you have this, you can define CH on your contour of Z as being integral of f of s ds upon s minus z over the contour. And the reason that you can do, do this now is that you take your parameterization of the curve, so s of some t, you substitute it in here, and then you end up with an integral with respect to the arc measure. So this is the usual way in uh, cal calculus where you have line, line integrals which are expressed in terms of some parameterized in integration. So all the natural things you can do with respect to these curves because you have a measure on these curves. You can integrate, you can have line, line integrals. Now comes to the most important thing of all.
we want to be sure that this operator here has got all the properties that we saw that the Cauchy transform had when we're just looking at the Cauchy transform on the real, a real line. Do we need to assume anything else about the contour sigma in order to conclude that? Well, we'll have that C uh, plus minus, C plus F, uh, at Z equals C mi minus C F at Z is equal to F of Z. Contain any F belonging to L P, where P now is bigger than one and less than infinity. Notice we include one. This still remains true. And similarly, for the Hilbert transform. But what's missing so far, although that exists as a pointwise limit, okay, so let me just take a step back. I skipped over something. Just on the assumption that the curve is rectifiable or locally rectifiable, you know the following. That because it's rectifiable, at almost every point there'll be a tan tangent vector at almost every point, which means you have a normal, and which means you have a cones. And this object here will have boundary values almost everywhere, which are non-tangential. -tan and this is true for all p bigger or equal to 1 and less than infinity. So that part of the theory, so we have uh, non-tangential boundary values, boundary values almost everywhere for f belonging to Lp, p bigger than 1 and less than infinity, as just as long as the contour sigma is locally rectifiable. So this much of the theory goes through completely in this way. And you get c plus minus c minus. What you don't know at this point is that the operator C plus and C minus are bounded in any function space. Now, there is an absolutely remarkable theorem in analysis, which in many people's view is one of the major achievements of the latter part of the, 19th, of the 20th century in analysis. And that is there are necessary and sufficient conditions on a rectifiable contour in order that C plus and C minus and hence the Hilbert transform. Again, you'll have C plus, minus will be plus or minus a half F plus I times the Hilbert transform of F, where again, HF at Z is I, to, uh, or one over pi times the limit as epsilon goes down to zero of uh, S minus Z bigger than epsilon, F of S D bar S upon S minus Z. And this is in the integral over the contour, so it's exactly the analog of what you'd expect. But now let me repeat that again. What we don't know is that the Hilbert transform or C plus or C minus is a bounded operator in LP. And there is a theorem which begins with Calderon in the 1950s, 1960s, then was developed by many people, Kaufman, Meyer, and McIntosh, and then eventually put in its fi final form by Guy, Guy David, which gives necessary and sufficient conditions necessary plus sufficient conditions on C plus minus or H to be in the bounded operators in LP. So what are those conditions? So you take your contour, and you take a point Z, and you take a ball of radius R, and you intersect the ball of radius R upon Z with the contour. So let me expand it out a bit. And here's the point Z, here's the ball, and your contour 
goes round like this and comes out like that. So you take the ball of radius r and you intersect it with the contour. And you compute the arc length of what there is in there. And you divide by r, and you take a soup of a r positive and all z in the contour, and you call that the quantity c gamma. And the theorem is this, remarkable theorem, is that uh, c plus minus or h r in LP, uh, bounded operators in LP, if and only if C gamma is finite. Remarkable theorem. Moreover, you can show that C gamma has a form looking like this, phi p of uh, C gamma, uh, the Okay, the bound. Suppose we have, okay, let me write it like this, that HF in P is bounded by CP times F and LP, and CP will have the form phi P of C gamma, where phi P is a function which goes to zero and some continuous function like this, which is independent of all contours. It's an a priori function. So this is a marvelously useful for for formula because as we hinted at early on, the steepest ascent method operates by deforming contours. So what's going to change as you change, change the contours is going to be this. But as long as these numbers remain fin uh, finite, you're going to retain this bound. Theorem is this. If C gamma is finite, then the operator H, for example, is bounded in L2. And then by some kind of method, we saw interpolation and things like this. You know it's going to be true for all LP bigger than 1. Conversely, if the Hilbert transform is bounded in L2 or in any fixed LP, it's bounded in all LP bigger than 1, and C gamma is finite. So let me just finish with the following remark. Here's an example. Take the contour y equals x squared, 0, this goes to 1, this goes to the point 1, 1. Take such a contour. As an exercise, I suggest it's obvious from here that C gamma is finite. And therefore, H uh, belongs to the bounded operator, say, in L2. Prove that the operator is a bound operator in L2 directly without this theorem. And you see that the effect of this cusp here is very non-trivial from the analytic point of view. So if you want to get something of the depth of the theorem, just work out this one example. Finish off with the following comment. A Riemann-Hilbert problem is going to be something which takes place on an oriented composed contour, each of whose arcs have a finite C gamma, and such arcs are called Carlson curves. So riemann hilbert problems take place naturally on composed curves, each of whose arcs is a Carlson curve. OK, thank you. Any quick question for Percy? Yes, no? No. So let's thank uh, Percy again. Bravo. Thank you. Okay. Sure.